And uh, let's just really quickly go around, introduce the panel. Um, so on my screen, first of all, we have Su Feng. Su Feng, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, Su Feng is my name. I'm senior lecturer with uh, Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher, Edu Higher Education. And my role really looking at um, engagement, collaboration and partnerships uh, between university and external stakeholders. And I'm really privileged and honoured to be here uh, joining you all having this conversation today. And next on my screen, I've got Catherine Manning. Catherine Manning, um, I'm the manager learning and teaching support and learning environment. So I head up a team of learning designers and teaching and learning consultants who live and breathe um, education and technology as part of their day and, you know, online learning design, that type of thing. And more yeah. recently, lots of digital assessment. Uh -huh. Yep. And that's kind of part of what we're going to be discussing today. And we've got Chris Deneen. Yes, I'm Chris Deneen. I'm also a senior lecturer with the Center for the Study of Higher Education. And I'm especially interested in assessment in higher education. And uh, I'm doing quite a bit of work around technology enhanced assessments. And a big chunk of which, given the last semester, has been how can we make the transition from in-place uh, closed book examinations to open book online exams. But I'm also interested in more expansive technologies like e-portfolios. And uh, next on my screen, I've got Brian, Brian Martin. Hello, uh, yes, my role in the university is as a digital teaching and learning advisor. I work in part of the university called Digital Transformation Operations. Um, in reality, that means I kind of end up working between folks in Chancellery Academic, learning environments, CSHE, um, faculties and schools, and my current projects are looking at enterprise-wide e-portfolio solution for the university. Um, and like Catherine, I've recently rolled off the mid-semester examination period, um, assisting with that process. Thank you, team. And uh, myself, I'm also from the Centre for Study of Higher Education here at uh, Melbourne University, although I'm working remotely from New Zealand. Uh, we were currently COVID-19 free, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, my particular role is, is really exploring technology enhanced learning uh, and the implications across the university. So uh, we've got quite a diverse team, which is great. And we all bring slightly different perspectives and different uh, experiences to the uh, discussion. So with our webinar, we'd really like it to be uh, discussion based and for people to ask questions, jump in at any time. So feel free to do that, turn your mic on and ask a question if you'd like to. Um, so today, just going to quickly introduce our webinar for today. So the title is uh, From Emergency to Emergent Practice, What We've Learned About Interaction and Engagement. So really looking a bit of a reflective uh, and critique on what's happened in semester one, particularly with uh, being online and the implications of COVID-19 for teaching and learning. So we've got two main questions we're, we're wanting to sort of explore and discuss today. Um, what have we learned from semester one experiences, uh, particularly in regards to design and our experience of, of interaction and engagement that, that uh, happened? Uh, and then what lessons have we learned regarding particularly teaching presence and how to facilitate effective communication online? So those are our two kind of guiding questions for today's webinar. Just a bit of a context. There's a great diagram here, which has been out for a while. I think it came out about, um, about April. Uh, exploring four different phases from the impact of COVID-19 on teaching and learning, with effectively phase one being what turned into semester one for most of us was the rapid online uptake to online, the switch to online learning um, as we had to social distance. And uh, phase two, I guess, getting to grips with that is a bit of a, an approach, um, very much um, really trying to make the, the quick switch to online actually work. Phase three being more of a, um, hopefully a bit of a, a mix between face-to-face -face and online with a little bit of back to 
campus and how do we make that work with a whole lot of other issues around how do we teach two different cohorts at once, uh, hybrid teaching, etc. Uh, and then phase four, these in this particular diagram is is what's the new normal? What what's what are, what are we going to be doing with as normal practice in the future and how's that going to look differently to what it was pre-COVID um, and all those sorts of issues that are around there. So I guess it's kind of where are we at and are we at phase two or phase three or, you know, has in particular Victoria perhaps gone back a bit, uh, you know, back towards phase two at this stage. It's you know, um, just the, the, uh, well, the second wave impact of COVID-19 how is that going to affect learning and, and what we're doing with our online practice? So we're going to be sort of discussing three areas effectively. What issues have we identified from semester one? What models can inform redesign for semester two? And what support strategies for online learning are available, particularly at uh, University of Melbourne? So we've got a few references there that might um, be useful for field to guide thinking. Uh, there's a link there to the webinar series and also to these notes if you want to have a look at them. So on to our discussion. So Chris, um, you had some reflections on we have been, we were heading some of the issues around, particularly around online exams. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> it's, um, we finally gotten through what I keep hearing is the toughest semester a lot of people have ever experienced. And that was including some of their first semesters ever teaching at university. Although in a few cases, those two things overlapped. And boy, I feel for those folks. Uh, but what we found, um, or what we're beginning to find right now, is a bit of a mixed picture on what came out of the exam findings. And I think we can extrapolate some other understandings too about assessment more generally, and maybe even learning engagements. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, both students and staff seemed fairly positive about the engagement with the technology. And what I mean by that is the facilitating technology to make the examinations actually happen seemed to be a relatively smooth experience. There were hiccups, predictably, but not nearly as bad as people thought they might be. And uh, I would argue maybe part of the reason for this is because we saw this coming, even if it was only a few weeks out. And I know learning environments, the center, and a lot of the faculties began to shift over into making sure that uh, some of the staff and the students were aware of how to use the technology uh, effectively. So actually, I would, I would start it with, with a high note by saying in one area where we were very worried, uh, it turns out we didn't need to be quite that worried. Yeah, and in fact, I've, I've heard sort of anecdotally from other universities, uh, uh, for example, Griffith University, uh, they um, suspended their student evaluations uh, for semester one, mainly because they felt that they would be effectively disadvantaged by that quick swing to online learning and that students uh, might not necessarily be getting the best experience of, of learning online. Um, but anecdotally, they've basically sort of said, well, their experience of student feedback has been most positive they've ever had. And so they kind of wish that they hadn't actually uh, <laughs> uh, student evaluations because they think they would be, um, you know, really good. We, we've been, and, and again, I have, to, I have to couch this and say also anecdotally, uh, that seems to be some of what is emerging here at University of Melbourne. Um, I'd, I'd quickly tilt it in the other direction, however, to say that one thing around uh, examinations that cropped up, um, I won't, I have to keep this anonymous at this point, but I can say that from one of the STEM disciplines, we already have uh, a really good nuanced set of survey results. Uh, it's a small group so far, but a well-developed survey looking both at the experience of the students and the staff. And one of the things that we did find 
was that there were a higher proportion or a perceived higher proportion of elevated scores and uh, a higher number of uh, academic integrity breaches. So to counterbalance my earlier point, um, we are seeing something that we predicted we might see with the transition to an online open book paradigm. Uh, and I think we're going to have to take some time this semester to tease out exactly how that happened, where it happened, and what kind of responses are the most productive ways so that we can get the numbers back where they should be. Yeah, I, I've also heard uh, anecdotally uh, from the school sector, um, you know, talking to uh, colleagues who are parents of teenagers, um, that, uh, you know, I guess pushing the boundaries of the, of the online system during uh, school exams was pretty uh, rife as well, where perhaps uh, students might have their logged into their online exam, but at the same time uh, be talking to their peers on, on Zoom meetings or, uh, you know, other, other meetings and collaborating. Um, but I guess that leads into a little bit later discussion around the design of, of appropriate online, online exams and learning. Could I, could I just add a little bit of quantified data to what Chris was saying about the, the relatively good experience that we had, which was perhaps surprising. Um, I got a sneak preview of some of the student um, learning and teaching data this morning. And one of the questions was, uh, exams and or digital assessment were trouble free for me. And only 5% strongly disagreed with that statement and 9% disagreed, 12% were neutral. So for the vast majority of students, it wasn't a disaster, but obviously there is a small number of students where it didn't go so well um, also. And I think maybe one of the reasons that we've had that result is we didn't go down the road of having uh, proctoring services within the university. Um, so I think that possibly saved us a lot of um, pain and um, also saved our students a lot of pain in the process yeah. as well. I guess that, that's twofold, isn't it? One is a, uh, te technology issue and, and cost uh, and management, but the other one is also a philosophical decision around um, what's appropriate for for measuring learning. Uh, and is proctoring actually a good approach? I mean, we, we kind of discussed that a bit last time, and I think uh, throwing it over to Catherine, it's kind of a bit where we, we uh, left off around the integration of assessment, examination, and technology. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, our Provost of Teaching Learning, uh, Gregor Kennedy, very specifically chose not to go down a proctoring path because he had a vision for the university, which I agree with, um, where he wanted to revolutionise how people thought about assessment and what assessment was. So going down a proctoring path would just reinforce old practices where if open book exams became the normal way, it does encourage that rethinking of what assessment might be. And I'm hoping that from what people are reflecting and have learnt from semester one, is that you know maybe we don't even need exams and we really need to sit down and think what does assessment look like now? Yeah. What is the most meaningful way for students for us to um, decide if students are competent in the, what we're teaching them? And that that's not a terrible outcome at all, is it? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. If it, if it fosters a deeper curriculum-based reflection on how we want to determine students' achievement and of course also support it and provide feedback, then I think, you know, the fact that it's it's a bit of a a bit of a ragged process during a tough semester, that's just a price that we could expect to have to pay. You know. Yeah, and, and I guess the um, you know the evidence in the literature basically say that uh, you know change is 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 stressful and um, people don't well most people don't uh, particularly uh, like change and uh, for change to happen, we effectively need some form of catalyst. So, and, and obviously in a big way, you know, um, in an unplanned way, COVID-19 has been a real catalyst for change and hopefully we can build it into actual positive uh, pedagogical change. I was wondering if any one of our um, participants here had any thoughts or questions or, you know, experiences that they wanted to, to share from semester one. 
got mirrored up there. Yep. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's been some challenges in the languages, in the language disciplines. Um, yeah, that's required quite a lot of, of rethinking. And I'm not quite sure. I don't have any data. I don't haven't really heard, you, you know, kind of whether there'll be things from that they can take forward when we're back face to face, but particularly around, you know, assessment of, of orals and um, even, you know, writing some of the, the Arabic characters, um, you know, some of the, the non-Latin scripts, things like that have been quite challenging. So the so online platforms haven't really supported that? Not really. I mean, yeah, we had a few, I think, that used Gradescope. We had, I think, maybe the Japanese and one other one other area that uh, used Cadmus, but all of that was pretty new to everyone. And um, I know the Cadmus team are doing a little bit of work to sort of better testing our characters, but um, yeah, just a, quite a few of our staff in the languages just didn't feel quite confident that characters would display properly. And yeah, it was just all of a bit of a, let's just see what we can do type approach, which was, yeah, a bit, um, Oh, I don't know, kind of <laughs> best we could do at the time. But yeah, there's definitely some challenges there. Mm. Yeah. I that guess it's kind of, for... yeah, kind of conflated by the fact of, of moving to Canvas at the same time. Um, you know, I guess that has its positive sides as well as its negative. Catherine. I was just going to say, so the sort of the technological Technology options that were put forward didn't meet all needs. It sounds like there were some gaps that fell out of that. Well, I think we met a lot of the needs, but I'm not surprised that there were some things that really couldn't fit nicely into an online assessment environment. I think it's maybe not a topic for this conversation, but I certainly think labs have struggled with the whole online area quite substantially. Yeah. Mm. Any other thoughts from our participants? Well, I know Sue Feng um, has, a, has a case study from Brazil. If we're starting to look mm. at what models could inform a redesign for semester two, um, Sue Feng has yeah, uh, thank what you. sounds like a really good example from Brazil. Yeah, I might share this um, really interesting one that uh, a group of academics from uh, business school uh, responded to COVID-19 in the context of Brazil. The, um, Brazil being one of the hardest hit country in the world where it's hugely impacted the small business, small and medium sized businesses, they, they're experiencing financial struggle and, 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 and the risk of closing down. So the academic actually transformed the entire learning and teaching assessment criteria to engage the students in developing uh, almost a slight um, I would say very innovative entrepreneurial uh, hub, they call it SOS emergency hub, for students to apply their knowledge and skill in consulting the local businesses and how to uh, ad address risks and how to apply financial uh, literacy in, in addressing some of the issues that are encountered by the small businesses in the community. And the students join and work together, have hundreds of them, 400 students, and the assessment task is very applied. And they work, they change the dynamic between the students and the academic relationship as co-partners, and then engaging with the real world in addressing real world problem. So within 10 days, they set the whole thing up and they did deliver a presentation to the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education two weeks ago. And they identified some of the readily available online technology platform that doesn't cost the university or the students or the staff members. So that can, for example, um, they use bot apps and they use padlets. They use multiple social medias to really promote uh, the messages outside. And within, they actually also have phase one, two, three, four, just like what uh, Tom had presented earlier. And their phases is actually uh, expanding from uh, the school of business to school of law, for example, and then the other uh, faculties to come on board and join them to address different types of real world problems. For example, school of law's academic joint force to deliver conflict resolution and mediation services. Uh, to assist the communities. The students come on board to apply a similar to our uh, work integrated learning framework. 
um, that uh, we use in Australia and, and um, student write critical reflections and lessons learned and those informations were used to strengthen the program as well as students learning, academic practices and research output. And this group of academics are fantastic. They're already writing um, books and they were interview on the news on the national TVs and radio. Um, again, uh, COVID-19 presents a catalyst for change. And I felt that, um, could we do it in University of Melbourne? And what are some of the barriers? What are, you know, that stop University of Melbourne academics or as an institution to transform the way we teach, the way we uh, assess and the way we engage. I would say it's a two very different culture contexts and two different legislation requirement, but potentially that could uh, something that for us to think about in this group, um, what is possible, what is not possible, how can we change and respond to the crisis that we are in? Can we do business as usual? Or is that a new normal that we need to rethink the way we engage with our students as co-learner or the way we engage with the real world, you know, real world is beyond campus and now we're online um, in a different way. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think um, just kind of reflecting on what you were saying, um, Su Feng, and the, uh, I, I suppose, you know, Melbourne has what uh, what's called the Melbourne model, don't we, of, of uh, mm. learning. And uh, how can that be transferred to the online experience? You know, the, the Melbourne model of learning, which is very much about, you know, uh, you know authentic engagement and community and, and uh, building that community uh, face-to-face and with the wider community. So how can we transfer that, that mobile model to online? And uh, I guess... For me, it's about really thinking about when you're designing your course and your course activities online. It's a, it's about thinking about community. How how is your course uh, modelling authentic community? How is it uh, connecting students and and thinking about social aspects and 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 building all those sorts of um, networks between uh, students and and uh, and between students and their teachers and students in the wider community. Uh, rather than just what we tend to focus on, which is the engagement between students and content, mm. um, get, get beyond content. So, you know, you, you say that, Tom, and immediately I thought, this is some of what's coming out of uh, the broad university-wide results that we're beginning to look at, is, you know, this issue of how are we engaging our students and how are we keeping them, you know, in the virtual subject, but then how do they perceive us as keeping ourselves in it? Where is our presence? Mm -hmm. And you know, you put those together and really you're talking about community and building community, aren't you? And so I think case studies like the one that Su Fang is bringing up seem to me to be a great way of exploring what we now know are issues of concern. Yeah, and the types of uh, engagement practices that, that Su Feng was referring right. to are right. very socially based and, and they're about, um, you know, the learner being part of the, you know, construction of knowledge, this construction of content yeah. and sharing that uh, and uh, sort of rethinking that whole approach. Yeah. I picked up on the, the students as partners yeah. thing immediately that pop that phrase popped right into my head when we were in our planning meeting and Su Fang told us a little bit about the case. I was like, aha, that is a student's as partners example. And that's a big thing. Yeah. 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 It's uh, UQ is a big center for students as partners initiatives. And really a lot of that just comes down to um, the, you know, the underpinning f- philosophy of, of your course. Uh, and that should filter through into its practice, how you go about um, engaging with your students and uh, thinking about the, the uh, design of the assessment um, as well. So that does kind of lead in, I think, to one approach, which I think is quite powerful. And, and Brian has been doing a lot of work on this, and I know you have as well, Chris, around e-portfolios as a sort of a viable, authentic alternative 
uh, assessment strategy and, and learning approach. So throwing over to Brian's for a bit of thoughts on, on e-portfolios, how they're coming along with um, University of Melbourne and uh, what you've learned from semester one for some of the e-portfolio projects. Yep, I'm, I might just um, uh, context that with just a, a couple more bits of data that I picked up this morning, which I think informed the discussion. One was a question around the teaching activities provided me with good opportunities for interaction and cl collaboration. So getting to that idea of students being able to interact with each other. And if we add up those, we've got either 41% are neutral or disagree um, in that space. So there's clearly an area that we, we sort of need to think about as we move forward. And this is, this other piece of data is not necessarily from the directly from the teaching and learning domain, but a question about well-being more generally was that I felt connected to other students and 60% disagreed with that. So that's not necessarily a, a direct problem for teachers, but it is something that perhaps we can do something about by trying to form more of a sense of community within our subjects. So yeah, just two bits of context there. Um, and in terms of, yeah, go on. I was going to say, Brian, these, this, this sort of findings isn't new for online learning. I think research for, for a fully online learning has gone back for as long as we've been doing fully online learning to, to say that the biggest challenges and the big things you need to address with online learning is your cohort building, ensuring that students are connecting with each other and, and your teacher present, ensuring that the students have a meaningful interaction and connection with the, with the, the teachers or the instructors in the subject. And it's been a challenge forever and, and online learning has come, come up with a lot of great ideas and suggestions and strategies to build it, but it has to be explicitly dealt with. It can't sort of be hoped for. You need to plan for dealing with it and you need to um, um, design your subject and think about your subject in a way that will deal with these issues. It, 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 it just doesn't happen like it does in a face-to-face -face environment. Yeah, and I think one of the powerful models for that is the idea of a community of inquiry or a community of practice. And there's, there's been a lot of literature on both of those concepts of, you know, how do we do that? How do we design a course as effectively a community of practice or a community of inquiry? And there's a lot of overlap, overlap between the two. And, and you can sort of say the community of inquiry is, is, is a subset of a community of practice. Um, you know, it's it's a really a interesting. Point. Yeah. yeah, I think that a lot of literature focusing on community inquiry practice based on a group face-to-face -face interactive context. So now we are really forced to really think about how do we use technology in engaging with communities, and that's really quite transformative to me. I think it really break all kind of boundaries, but also exacerbate inequality in a different way. So those who have access to Wi-Fi or technology and those who do not have access uh, would actually be, you know, really play out. Similarly to in a face to face context, when we talk about engaging a community with other students, um, those who are left out often are in a regional area uh, or those who are far, far away from the campus. So potentially that really gives us a, a thinking, a new lens to rethink how do we really incorporate those community based learning and teaching um, in, a, in a blended uh, way. Uh, in preparation to post-COVID uh, time, um, you know, people from around the world can actually engage in a webinar like this um, without having to fly or, or drive uh, to a location to really engage in that place space um, learning and teaching. And then virtual platform is definitely quite liberating. Um, and again, really about uh, the, ro ro the role of the academics and then learning and teaching designers to rethink how do we maximize this opportunity to truly, uh, you know, really reassert the role of the university as a public institution that we're here for you. We are here together uh, in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. it even filters down to the tools we use and uh, if you're trying to build a community online and, and, and model it around a community of practice or community inquiry, then the tools need to be able to facilitate that. And, and uh, you know, often our default tools don't because uh, the LMS is by design teacher-centric, isn't it? And, and it's administered by the teacher. It's not, not a student space. Um, and, and I guess that kind of segues us back into that idea of e-portfolios uh, where we were looking at um, student spaces and then bringing those into the learning environment. So. 
yeah, back back to Brian and Chris to talk us talk us through ideas around e portfolios. Yeah, I'll just say something quickly about yeah, I, I love the idea of the e portfolio as a student centred space and also as a potential mediator between wholly online learning um, and this sort of flexible mode that we're going to have to be in. Um, for the foreseeable future so it really does give the students a space that they have agency over and there's there's lots of um, educational literature that supports e-portfolios as a, a valuable learning tool and assessment practice and Chris will be able to speak to that with more authority than me um, but I've definitely been thinking a lot about e-portfolios as a place where students can be that is not institutionally mediated so they're not necessarily under surveillance, they're not controlled, they have agency over the environment, they have agency over the way that they construct their own learning. They get to choose who they get to share their learnings with. They can form their own small communities of interests, um, whether they be with other students or scholarly communities with academics. Um, and then there's also the ability to construct um, presentation portfolios and assessment portfolios when it comes back full circle round to um, to Chris's area of expertise, which is in e-portfolios and assessment. So I guess that's the handover to you, Chris. Yeah, that was oh, my segue. I will, I will, but I noticed, Liz, did you have your hand up a moment ago? I saw you, I saw you going like this. I think your mute is still on, though. Yeah, the old, the old. Okay. Um, well, thanks, thanks for inviting us, and I'm sorry, uh, Christina and I were both Christina from FAST is here as well, but we we're both a little late joining because I think we had, we struggled with the link. Well, it didn't, it didn't appear to be working, but it's fantastic to, to be with you. Simply to say, in terms of the um, that sense of community, one thing that I, for us worked well in, um, in FAS was um, uh, our case studies, which were our workshops, which we had to put online. Um, we broke the students into groups and they formed their own little Zoom group and worked together through their case study and then we came together at the end and in fact I think um, we found that there were more students posting questions and um, and answering one another one another's questions in the chat function of zoom than we would typically have in a in a face-to-face -face class I think there's something that we found that they don't particularly like discussion boards I think that discussion boards are sort of there for all time and they have this sense of oh gosh that silly question that I asked six weeks ago is still sitting there on the discussion board, whereas the chat room is much more immediate and um, students, as I said, who typically might not have contributed to a class discussion were quite active in the chat room. It's, it's kind of a bit like that, uh, the Snapchat generation, isn't it? Uh, where uh, people are quite happy to share, um, you know, what they're doing in their life uh, very, very quickly, but then it disappears. So that's part of the appeal is it's not a permanent trace as such or at least uh, the perception is it's not permanent that's um, right yes. yeah. yeah yeah that was all thank you so the question there's a question in the chat um chris around where are we at with the e-portfolio projects Do you want oh, me to I'm, take... gonna, I'm gonna whip that over to brian <laughs> yeah he's gonna get that one back <laughs> over to me so, so yeah just i was going to answer in the chat but just quickly um the like a lot of things the e-portfolio project got a big cut um, due to COVID-19. However, we're still alive and what we're trying to do in 2020 is to get a bunch of smaller proofs of concept or pilots up and running, um, particularly for those people who want to do some playing around and design work with a view to doing something in 2021. Um, and the master plan at this stage and the jury's still out on this is to try and get a large chunk of our funding reinstated for 2021 so that we can re prosecute this project because as we're going through this and talking about it the, the need for this kind of platform is just growing all of the time um, with the, with the move to mostly a an online or flexible mode of learning so very keen to hear from anyone who would like to help us choose uh, an e-portfolio platform or platforms for the university and who would like to um, work with the project team and cats team in learning environments and, and also with with Chris and the CSAG and thinking about how they can uh, think about e-portfolio pedagogy and assessment moving forward. So what about, what about thoughts, Chris, around, I mean, sorry, Brian, Brian and Chris, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> do we really need to buy a system? Do we need to pay for a system? I mean, can't we just, um, you know, piggyback on something like WordPress, which, you know, has is, is been around for 
close, probably close to 25, 30 years now and, uh, and is really, really flexible and, and uh, can basically cost you nothing. I'll, I'll take a stab at it um, with a proviso that uh, Brian's knowledge in the Uni Melbourne context is a lot deeper than mine because he's been really working very close on this. Um, what I did a few years ago when I was in Hong Kong was um, a, uh, a funded bit of research into e-portfolio use. And part of that was what do people respond well to? What do they really have an allergic reaction to technology-wise and platform-wise? And generally speaking, people seem fairly technology agnostic. But what they really don't like are being forced into a box. Uh, literally or metaphorically, in some cases it was literally where you have to put your text in this particular box, mm. uh, or um, feeling like they're being put onto a steep learning curve in order to get some fairly basic results. And then the final one that people reacted quite negatively to was the what's the point issue. And I think, Tom, that really relates most to the point that you're raising, which is I think any technology that uh, is e-portfolio oriented, it has to have some kind of value addedness beyond something that is an extremely basic approach like WordPress. Uh, I've seen some, and I, I hope I don't ruffle any feathers, but the one that students reacted most poorly to a few years back was Mahara. Uh, now Mahara has come out with a better, newer version since then, but the bottom line is that even though this stuff was intended, it's an e-portfolio specific platform, uh, people said, well, yeah, but what's the point? Because what this really is about is curating my own resources and then talking through in a bit of a synoptic text what those resources add up to. Well, I don't, I don't need some big fancy solution to do that. So why are you forcing me to do this? Mm. I think the um, what people conceive as an e-portfolio and what they're looking for, for to achieve is so varied across disciplines and even people, and it's it's very hard to... WordPress would work in some situations without a problem, but it will not work in all the yeah. scenarios we're getting around in the use cases we have for um, portfolios. There is something to consider, and I have to say this from a central technology sort of support role, um, that... Um, academic staff, teaching staff going off and just choosing a platform and getting students to use it when it's not been endorsed by the university is actually becoming more problematic rather than less. And students are getting much more, and we're seeing this this year more than ever, um, much more um, vocal and concerned about privacy and where their data is going and what it's doing. So unless a product's actually gone through, you know, a formal privacy impact state assessment and looking at the legality of it, we can't actually be pushing a tool, you know, like, yes, flip, flip chart or uh, flip book or whatever looks great, but no one's really looked at that from where the dollar's being stored, all those sort of things. And we have to be much more careful than we have been in the past and just, let's just give this a go and we'll give it a try. And I hate to say that because it's a, it's a, it's a, it doesn't encourage innovation, but it is what the students are demanding more than ever. Yeah, and I, I don't envy Brian his task of finding uh, a solution <laughs> that seems to work across the university because having done a little research into this stuff, I recognize exactly the point that Kat is raising, which is that different disciplines are going to have different needs. Um, mm -hmm. We encountered this a while back when we tried to launch a new portfolio project at the University of Hong Kong in uh, medical education. And one of the things we immediately ran into, of course, was uh, data privacy rules that were considerably more restrictive than if you were trying to launch this in, say, the architecture uh, uh, program, and rightfully so, because you're dealing with even secondary or tertiary patient data, you have to consider all of those concerns. Well, that might mean that you're led into an entirely different platform, but you have Agreed. to. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that's the key is is looking at the context and and once again sort of saying, well, there's not one size fits all. Um, because there isn't, the, you know, that's just the real world. Um, but then looking at what, what, are the, um, what, what are the contexts that the graduates are going into and what's most appropriate for that. So, you know, if they're going into a business uh, arena, then, then possibly LinkedIn is, is, is perfect. 
Um, if, if they're art students, then uh, graphics arts is probably something like Behance. Uh, you know? And so the, there are a, a multitude of tools that you could choose. Um, but then as Catherine says, it comes down to the support and making the connection between uh, why, why are we choosing this platform rather than just, oh, this is really cool, it's a new thing, let's give it a go. Um, so really sort of thinking critically through those issues and what's appropriate for that context or not. So I guess that kind of brings us into our third area of discussion for today, which is really what, what support have we got available for perhaps redesigning learning for semester two uh, for online learning. And I wanted to throw it over to Catherine to, you know, what is learning environments? Uh, what, 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 what can people, um, what support can we get from learning environments? Well, we can fix everything. <laughs> I wish it was true. Um, and I had the staff for that. But um, one of the, I've, uh, a lot of the, my team have been funded through uh, FlexApp and we are actively supporting the projects that have come through FlexApp. So we are definitely supporting those. And of course, there's an application process that's been approved, et cetera, et cetera. So you've that's definitely missed a boat, but that is an area that we're supporting heavily. The, the latest round of LTIs had a, a category two, um, we could call it category two, um, which was about improving online learning quality. And it was really looking at um, how to kind of go very much the topic for today from that emergency learning design to sort of the emergent. What are the, the next steps you can do that to build your online learning skills and, and understanding? And we created a whole lot of resources on the learning environments website to support that particular round. And I, if you if people are really wondering you know what's next i really encourage you to go have a look at them it's it's just some it's some um activities that are kind of they won't take a lot of time but they'll have a lot of impact and it'll have that impact in those areas that we're really caring about like teacher presence student engagement so um they're called the uh, implementing online learning quality i'm just looking at the website um uh, page and the niches in there and, and that is a great resource and we, we're building that out even this week with some more examples and things to help people just in their own time and their own ability to, to use those resources and of course we're happy to um, to talk as needed um, and it's always matter just lodging a service now request and we'll talk we'll talk and I'm sure um, where needed we'll bring in MCSHE people as well. So if people just head to the learning environment site they'll find a link to these resources? They'll invite, yep, um, they'll invite a link to the resources. I can show you the page, uh, I believe. No, I can't. <laughs> you have to make me co-host, Sue <laughs> Fang. I said I didn't need it, but it turned out I did. <laughs> uh, this one, here we go. Share. So this is the Learning Environments website. Um, we've actually put this page together with the help of Chance here in preparing for online learning. It kind of talks about those three areas that um, I suppose we're really trying to focus an uplift, but what I was just talking about, the implementing online learning quality area, which has things like doing um, virtual office hours, how to do a moderated um, discussion list, um, how to do a fortnightly synchronous question and answer. So these sort of sort of, little tricks that help with that those engagements um, and if I go back to the learning environments page um, many digital assessment options are also explained there because we're talking about digital assessment and we're happy to support any of those and I've got staff that are um, their job is to support digital assessment entirely um, so we're really happy to hear but uh, down this page we've got the support center and you can log a request should you need it and I'll right. stop sharing and the URL was just le.unimail.edu.au. Yep, I'll put it in the chat. Cool. So uh, one of the new things that we're doing with CSHE is kind of wanting to build a bit of a community around the Scholarship of Technology Enhanced Learning. So I'm just uh, sharing um, the, the page here for that. Is that coming through? Yep, cool, great. So uh, this is just very much under development and um, we're encouraging people who are wanting to explore uh, the critical issues around how technology you know, integrates with teaching and learning from a scholarly perspective and wanting to create a, a research network right across the university. So it's really applied research to practice uh, and in this case particularly technology enhanced learning. So 
this is the link um, is just obscured by my menu at this point, uh, but it's blogs. Here it is. I'll just bring it down so I can see it. Blogs.unimelb.edu.au and slash sotel. Uh, there should be a link going on to the CSHC site for, for this soon. And uh, just trying to basically create a bit of a resource, a bit of a uh, you know cross seeding between different departments and ideas and and that whole thing of you don't need to reinvent the wheel if someone's got a really good idea say in uh, fam that may be applicable to uh, you know cis or 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 um, any number of other departments and so trying to curate what people are doing in various departments and so here's one around immersive reality and uh, just giving people to um, become part of this extended network so just a bit of a push for that. There'll be a call coming out, um, hopefully in the next newsletter as well. So that's one resource. And I think, Chris, you could probably point people to a few more from CSHE. I can. I was just multitasking here, responding to, uh, <laughs> to Brian's in-text questions about uh, uh, a particularly, he hit me with a particularly insidious question. <laughs> Uh, what do we know about the validity, reliability, and efficiency of e-portfolios in assessment? Um, but yeah, there, there are all sorts of resources. I'll tell you right now, we just had a discussion about getting our resource page uh, uh, together a few weeks ago, and we've shifted our resource page uh, uh, in the center, and you can actually find it, um, uh, I want to say it's under our professional development uh, tab. But um, it's. I think it comes under programs. Is it under programs? Yeah. yeah. I, I've got the link. I'll put it in the chat. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. And so um, after getting some feedback, we've moved away from kind of a scattershot approach and something that's a little bit more organized according to here's some short how to guides, and then here's a little bit more of a scholarship. Uh, beyond that, too, though, outside of what we do, it's always worth looking at the Texa uh, Expert Advice Hub. And uh, that's a really great source for short guides. We do have some from University of Melbourne up there, I'm very happy to say. Uh, but also you'll get a lot of different stuff from a lot of different folks at different universities. They also do webinars. And so it's worth looking on our site, but also the Texas site uh, to look for those webinars. Uh, the other one I'll, I'll mention is uh, Deakin University's Cradle the Center for Research on Assessment in Digital Learning. And that's, uh, David Baud founded that center. Uh, Phil Dawson is doing a lot of the day-to-day -day running of it. And so, uh, you know, it's some really top, top level scholarship coming out of there. And a lot of it is around exactly the kind of stuff we're talking about. Cool. We've pretty much come to the end of our uh, what we were wanting to cover in this discussion. I guess it's, uh, you know, we've got a few minutes left if you want to just throw it open to questions, uh, you know, comments from uh, from people. So any thoughts that people want to talk about or share? Perhaps even ideas for future webinars. Our current idea for next one is uh, debunking myths about online learning and teaching. Like that. Kate, do you want to say something about the ePortfolios Australia conference coming up soon? Oh, why not? But then I have to do an obligatory plug for um, our upcoming webinar that I am also <laughs> presenting at. Um, so uh, I'll put the ePortfolios Australia link in. So there's um, there's a few actually good things coming up. I just put a link to the latest Cradle seminar that's coming up. Um, ePortfolios Australia, we've got one in August coming up that is around um, ePortfolios for employment and the employer and employee perspectives. Um, the ePort Forum that happens in October will have a number of uh, peer reviewed papers, uh, short kind of 20 by 20 sort of Petra Kutcher type um, presentations and some workshops. Um, I'm not sure if, I think we're still kind of putting out the last of the calls for workshops and, and uh, posters, but papers have closed. 
Um, and then there's, uh, what was the other one that was recently that came out that I saw? Oh, I'm having a mental blank. Um, uh, I'll put the link to that, hang on, uh, to ePortfolios Australia in there. Uh, there we go. Um, and there's heaps of stuff coming out at the moment. Just so many good things. So um, if you're not on Twitter, that seems to be a good place to find out about what's going on with some stuff. Um, but it sounds like uh, the, what you've got planned. Oh, that's right. That's the other one. There's, we have got a joint uh, herds uh, academic developers and uh, televisors, Ascolite uh, groups who have got, uh, we've got an event uh, plans. Let me grab the event link for that. Uh, that is around. So that's probably a little bit more for people like me and like um, a few of the people on the panel. Uh, although I think we're still welcome, welcoming academic, you know, academic teaching staff as well. Uh, and that is, let me grab the link for that. There we go. The virtual symposium, if you're wanting to be a part of that. Uh, that's coming up uh, early September. So that's sort of talking about um, lessons learned from COVID-19. So I guess it's a good book into this one. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to hear about debunking myths in online learning. Yeah, so I guess that's a, a bit of a segue into a wind up wrap up for for today. But if you keep an eye on the uh, the new normal uh, page on um, the CSHE site, and if I just um, bring that up, you can see that there. Uh, so it's coming off our CSHE site, the professional development uh, link, and then the new normal uh, webinar series. Uh, we'll be putting up details the next one coming up. So we're planning to do, do these once a month and try to keep them pretty relevant to what's uh, current. So thank you, everyone. Um, thanks you for dialing in, participating. Thanks to our illustrious panel for the discussion and uh, sharing ideas and, and uh, hopefully provoking some, some real thinking uh, for next semester. So we'll end our, our session there for today. And thank you all very much. Thanks, Thank Thomas. You all. See ya. Thank you. Take care.